This is the lecture video for Chapter 11, Chemical Bonding 2, Molecular Shapes, Valence Bond Theory, and Molecular Orbital Theory. Here we're going to take a look at different molecular geometries, which determine chemical and physical properties, which are all based on the Lewis bonding model. We'll also take a look at two other bonding theories, which help explain bond length and strength and even resonance. Morphine is an opioid, which causes feelings of happiness and reduces feelings of pain. And it has a similar structure to naturally produced endorphins. This is why morphine can bond to nerve cell receptors found in the brain and cause those feelings of happiness. The active site on the receptor is very specific, and this is really similar to the active site of an enzyme. If the substrate does not have the right structure, then the substrate cannot bind to that active site. So if the structure of morphine changed just a little bit, then it would not bind to the active site on the receptor. And so then no more feelings of euphoria. After drawing out the Lewis structure of a molecule and figuring out the type of covalent bond that holds the atoms together in that molecule, we can then figure out the shape and thus the properties of that molecule. We'll need to count uh, how many bonds there are and also the lone pairs. So if you still have trouble in drawing out Lewis structures, you would need to review that before you continue. When drawing out Lewis structures, you have to remember that molecules are three-dimensional. So if you have a molecular model kit, it'll be beneficial for you to use that kit throughout this chapter. Also, if you need to review a little bit of geometry, uh, then please do so because that'll be very helpful in figuring out bond angles and even the geometric structure of the molecule. After we've drawn our Lewis structure, we're going to have to take a look at how many electron groups there are around the central atom. So this includes the covalent bonds, as well as the lone pairs that are only found on the central atoms. Remember that electrons are negatively charged. So with all of these electron groups found on the central atom, they're going to repel each other. So that includes the covalent bonds as well as the lone pairs. And because of this repulsion, we'll see the different geometries for each molecule. Here we have a molecule with one central atom and three terminal atoms. The central atom is connected to a terminal atom by a single covalent bond. And we know that because in between the central atom and the terminal atom is one pair of electrons. So this pair here is being shared by the central and the terminal atoms. So you could see how these electron groups are arranged in the molecule. They're evenly spread out. So we don't have, you're never going to see two terminal atoms bunched up close together. Why? Because of the repulsions, because of the repulsive forces between the electron groups. Okay, so uh, this is where um, elementary school geometry can help you out. Imagine that there's a big circle here in the center of this molecule. Okay, now how many degrees does a circle have? 360. 
Okay, so now let's draw a line between the center of the circle to each of the terminal atoms. There we go. Okay, so like we said before, all these terminal atoms are evenly spaced out. We have a very stable molecule here. So what is 360 divided by 3? 120. So the bond angle between this terminal atom, the central atom, and this terminal atom is 120 degrees. This is how you figure out bond angle in all of the molecular geometries. So the whole idea of spacing out electron groups in a molecule is called valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or VSEPR theory. Looking at the central atom, we have to count how many bonds there are and how many lone pairs, and then use that combination of electron groups to figure out molecular geometry. Here we have the Lewis structure for the nitrite ion, and nitrogen is the central atom. So now let's count how many electron groups there are on nitrogen. So we have one, we have two, and then we have three. Even though this is a double bond, you're counting it as one electron group. So think about what you're saying. This is one electron pair, not pairs, it's one pair. This is one single bond, and this is one double bond, not double bonds. So if you have one double bond or one triple bond, those are each considered one electron group. Before we get into molecular geometries, we first need to take a look at electron geometries. These are the most basic arrangements and they're considered perfect geometric figures because all of the electron groups are bonds. You're not going to see any lone pairs on the central atom in the next several slides. So this is going to help you in understanding molecular geometries, which are just a little bit more complicated than electron geometries. Before we get into the different electron geometries, we need to revisit resonance. So here, it doesn't matter which resonance structure you use, because they're all gonna be the same thing when you're trying to figure out electron geometry. So here are the three resonance structures for nitrate, nitrate polyatomic ion, take a look at the nitrogens in all three structures and count how many electron groups there are. You'll see in each of the structures there are three electron groups because remember with resonance the atom connectivity does not change. Nitrogen is still the central atom in all three structures. What's changing? the positions of the electrons. So again, if you're trying to figure out electron geometry and your ion or your structure happens to be a resonance structure, it doesn't matter which resonance structure you use. Let's take a look at molecules that have two electron groups connected to the central atom. This type of geometry is called linear, linear geometry because you see a line being formed. So here with BeCl2 and carbon dioxide, they both form straight lines. So the bond angle 
the bond angle in both of these structures is 180 degrees. So imagine that these two balloons here are the two chlorine terminal atoms and the beryllium is found in the middle. You could see that there is a linear ge geometry with these two balloons. When we add another electron group, we have a trigonal planar geometry. Trigonal because you could see that we could form a triangle here with the three fluorines. And planar because all four of these atoms lie in the same plane. So picture having a piece of paper and having all four of these atoms lie on the piece of paper. Okay, so you could almost think of this geometry as two-dimensional. Okay, you could think of linear as, as two-dimensional also. So we've seen this electron geometry before in an earlier slide. So remember that a circle has 360 degrees. And if we divide that circle into three equal parts, the bond angle that we have here is 120 degrees. Let's check for understanding. We have a central atom that forms two double bonds. There are no lone pairs. So what is the geometry of this molecule? So pause the video, read through the choices carefully, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. The answer here is letter B, linear. Think back to carbon dioxide, or just flip back to the slide that had carbon dioxide. Carbon is the central atom, and it has two double bonds. One double bond is connected to one oxygen, and the other double bond is connected to the second oxygen. Now we're starting to get into geometries that have a more 3D shape. So if a central atom has four electron groups, it has a tetrahedral electron geometry. Now, our example here is methane, CH4. We would normally draw the Lewis structure like this, and this is fine, but this is deceptive because if you're asked what the bond angles were, you might just say, okay, 90 degrees, because I see a right angle here, and I see four right angles, so this must be 90 degrees. But remember, these bonds are electron groups, so they're negatively charged. They want to be as far apart from each other as possible. So 90 degrees is not going to work. The bond angle is actually 109.5, and it's going to look like this. So now, which atoms are in the same plane? It's this carbon this hydrogen, and this hydrogen. Okay, if you have a tetrahedral geometry, the central atom is gonna be in the same plane as two other terminal atoms. This hydrogen right here, you need to imagine it poking out from the screen towards you. This hydrogen here, Imagine that one poking behind the screen away from you. This is the tetrahedral geometry. If you have um, the ball and stick model kit, I highly suggest you create this model so that you could see the 109.5 degree bond angle. This is another good way in showing the 3D shape of the tetrahedral. So imagine the carbon right here in the center, and these four corners represent the four hydrogens. 
Here we have hydrogen cyanide. What is the electron geometry for this hydrogen cyanide? So pause the video, count how many electron groups there are on the carbon, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. So the answer is A. There are only two electron groups. So we have one single bond and one triple bond. One bond plus one bond is two bonds, so two electron groups. That gives us a linear geometry. Now let's take a look at five electron groups on the central atom. This geometry, this electron geometry, is called trigonal bipyramidal. Now let's take this one word at a time. Trigonal, you're going to think of triangle. Bipyramidal, okay, we know bi means two, and you should all know what a pyramid looks like. So think of two pyramids. Where does the triangle come in? Well, think of the base of a pyramid. It's in the shape of a triangle. Okay, so try to picture that in your mind. Trust me, it'll be very helpful once you need to start memorizing these different geometries. So when you have five electron groups, Think of two pyramids stuck to each other, having the same triangle base. All right, so here's our molecule, PCl5. It can have an expanded octet, the phosphorus. Okay, so here is our triangular base. Here's our first chlorine, our second, and our third forming the triangular base. Now, where's the pyramid? Okay, well, the first one, think of this chlorine as the apex of the pyramid, the topmost point. So we got one pyramid with the triangular base. Now, where's our second pyramid? Uh, it's down here. Here's the other apex, sharing the same triangular base. Okay, so here in this one, you have to take note of the different terminal atoms. It's going to make a difference later on. So where our two apices are, those are called the axial positions. Those are the axial positions. The three chlorines here that form the base are called the equatorial position. So think of the equator. Think of the equator of the Earth. When you're trying to figure out the bond angle between two equatorial positions, think of the trigonal uh, planar geometry. Okay, that bond angle is 120 degrees. Now, if you're going from an axial position to an equatorial position, well, now take a look at that bond angle. It's now 90 degrees. So there are several takeaways here. Make sure you know the different terminal atom positions there are in the trigonal bipyramidal geometry, and also the two different bond angles, one between two equatorial positions and the other, the 90 degrees between an axial and an equatorial position. With the balloons, you could see the three equatorial positions with the 120 degree bond angle and also the two axial positions. And don't forget, going from axial to equatorial, the bond angle is 90 degrees. An octahedral geometry has six electron groups. Again, you could think of two pyramids, but having 
a square base that's being shared. All the positions are equivalent, so you don't have to worry about axial or equatorial. And all the bond angles that you see would be 90 degrees. Here we have S, F, 6. Remember that sulfur can have an expanded octet, so that's why there are uh, six electron groups on sulfur. Don't forget that all of these bonds are equivalent, so you don't have to worry about axial or equatorial. Okay, so if we highlight these four terminal atoms, you can see the square base. Okay, and here we have the top of one pyramid, and here is the apex of the other pyramid. And both of these pyramids share the same base. Okay, so it doesn't have to be uh, this arrangement. It's just easier for us visually. Okay, you could also pick these four as the square base and have this fluorine be the apex of one pyramid and the other fluorine directly opposite as the apex of the other pyramid. Okay, so you can do this with octahedral geometry because all of these bonds are equivalent. This picture right here would give you a better idea of the octahedral. Because if you have two pyramids with a square base, you're forming a shape that has eight sides, and hence octahedron or octahedral geometry. So let's figure out the electron geometry for nitrate. Draw out the Lewis structure for one of the three resonance structures. Again, it doesn't matter which one you draw, they're all gonna be equivalent. So please pause the video, draw out the structure, count how many electron groups there are, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so don't forget about the first step. You have to count how many valence electrons there are. So we're working with 24 here. And again, you can draw one of these resonance structures to figure out the electron geometry. You'll see that all 24 electrons have been used in all three structures. And we have complete octets for the nitrogens and all the oxygens. Okay, so let's just take a look at this one right here, the leftmost structure. We see that we have one, two, three electron groups. When we space out the oxygens as far as possible, we have bond angles of 120 degrees, and three electron groups would give us an electron geometry of trigonal planar. Now figure out the electron geometry for CCl4. Pause the video so that you could draw out the Lewis structure and count how many um, electron groups there are. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so here is the Lewis structure. We have carbon as our central atom and the four chlorines as our terminal atoms. And we have one, two, three, four electron groups. So this gives us a tetrahedral electron geometry. Now let's take a look at molecular geometry, which is going to be different from electron geometry. With molecular geometry, we have to take into consideration how many lone pairs there are. So now thinking back with electron geometry, 
we didn't see any lone pairs. We just saw covalent bonds. So as we add more lone pairs to the central atom, the geometry, the molecular geometry, is going to be different from the electron geometry. You'll see that when we add lone pairs to the Lewis structure, the bond angles are going to change a little bit. And that's because the lone pairs take up a lot of space. So here with uh, CH2O, you're going to see that the bond angles are not quite 120 degrees all around. Again, picture the very large lone pairs found on oxygen. These lone pairs are negatively charged. These bonds are also negatively charged. So there is going to be some repulsion. Because the lone pairs are so big, they're going to push these hydrogens closer together. So now what's going to happen to the bond angle between these two hydrogens? They're going to be smaller than 120 degrees. So now what effect would that have between the H, the C, and the O? Well, the bond angle there is going to be a little bit larger than 120 degrees. So what's going to happen to the repulsive forces when more lone pairs are added to the structure? Well, again, because of the large size of the lone pair, having two of them together would result in a very large repulsive force. These two lone pairs are going to need a lot of space. Now, if you compare that with two bonding pairs, they're not going to take up a whole lot of space. And plus, those shared electrons are going to be stabilized between two positively charged nuclei. So we don't have to worry about repulsive force too much between bonding pairs. It's the lone pairs that would alter the structure of the molecular geometry. Here's a nice visual comparing um, a bond compared to a lone pair. The bond is found between two atoms or two nuclei. And this is very stable because this negative charge is found in between two positively charged nuclei. With the lone pair, you see how much space it takes up. So if there was a bond here between the two nuclei, it's going to affect the bond angle. The lone pair will affect the bond angle because of its large size. OK, so with three electron groups, that gives us an electron geometry of trigonal planar. OK, think of the three terminal atoms in the same plane as the central atom. Now, take away one of those terminal atoms and place a lone pair. You're not going to have something that's trigonal planar anymore. You have what's called a bent shape. So yeah, you could draw it out like this. It looks linear, but it's not linear. In actuality, it looks like this. OK, it's bent because of the big lone pair. All right, and because of that, the bond angle is going to be less than ideal. It'll be less than 120 degrees. Now we're taking a look at four electron groups. So that's a tetrahedral electron geometry. Now let's take away one of those covalent bonds and turn it into a lone pair. We now have a pyramidal geometry. 
So NH3 is a classic example of that. Instead of having a terminal H sticking up here, we just have a lone pair. So instead of the ideal 109.5 degree bond angle, we have something a little bit smaller, 107 degrees. So this lone pair, it's going to act like the apex and push these terminal hydrogens closer together. Sticking with four electron groups, let's add another lone pair. So here we have water, another classic example. We still have four electron groups, but two of them now are lone pairs. So we don't have a tetrahedral geometry anymore. We have specifically a tetrahedral bent geometry. Or you could simply just say a bent geometry. You'll see both terms in your textbook. Here, this is a very nice picture showing the effect of lone pairs on the bond angles. So here with CH4, it, ha it has a molecular and a electron geometry of tetrahedral. When you take away one of the bonds and add a lone pair, we now have trigonal pyramidal for NH3 as the molecular geometry. And for water, H2O, we have two lone pairs. And take a look at the bond angle here. It's even smaller, 104.5 degrees. And this has a bent molecular geometry. The electron geometries for NH3 and H2O are still tetrahedral. Okay, there's the difference there. If you're looking for electron geometry, you're counting electron groups. But for molecular geometry, you have to consider the number of lone pairs. Let's test for understanding. What is the molecular geometry of a molecule whose central atom has three bonding groups and one lone pair? So pause the video, look back, pick your choice, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. The answer here is letter D, trigonal pyramidal. So think back to NH3 with the three covalent bonds and one lone pair. Also, don't forget about the bond angle, 107 degrees. Now let's take a look at five electron groups. So the trigonal bipyramidal electron geometry. What's going to happen here when we add lone pairs. So this is where the different positions are important. Lone pairs are gonna have to occupy the equatorial positions. Why? Because there's more space in the equatorial positions compared to the axial. So if we need to have one lone pair, we have a seesaw shape. Okay, so now let's take a look at what happens if we try to add that lone pair in the axial position. Think about the bond angles. Going from axial to equatorial, we have a bond angle of 90 degrees. Well, we have three fluorines that have that bond angle, so this lone pair isn't gonna have a whole lot of space. Now let's take a look if we put that lone pair in the equatorial position. Yeah, we're still gonna have the 90 degree interference, that 90 degree repulsion, but that's only with two fluorines. Remember what the bond angle is for the equatorial positions, 120 degrees. So this lone pair is going to have a lot more space 
So if you take a look at this molecular geometry here, you'll see that it does kind of look like a seesaw. You're just going to have to tilt your head to the left to actually see the seesaw. So don't forget, the molecular geometry is seesaw, but the electron geometry is still trigonal bipyramidal because we have five electron groups. If we add another lone pair, still has to occupy an equatorial position. So if we have two lone pairs and three bonding groups, we have what's called a T-shape. So if we get rid of these two lone pairs, remember it's still there, but we're not going to include it in our picture here. We do that so that you could actually see the T-shape molecular geometry. Now what happens when you need to add another lone pair? So we have three lone pairs that gives us a linear shape. All of the lone pairs occupy all of the equatorial positions. So we just have the central atom and our terminal atoms in the axial position. So now take a look. Our molecular geometry is linear. Our electron geometry is still trigonal bipyramidal because of the five electron groups. So now let's take a look at the last group. We have octahedral electron geometry, so that's six electron groups. What happens when we need to add one lone pair? We're going to have a square pyramidal shape. So it doesn't matter which terminal atom you want to take away because they're all equivalent. Okay, but usually, especially in this textbook, um, the terminal atom that's pointed downward, that's going to be replaced by a lone pair. And I feel like they do this because here it's easier to see the square base and the apex up top so that you could easily visualize the square pyramidal molecular geometry. Okay, so now what happens if you need to add a second lone pair to this electron geometry? We're going to have a square planar shape. Now, this is where position matters. So with our previous um, molecular geometry, square pyramidal, this terminal atom was replaced with a lone pair. If you need to add a second lone pair, you have to remove the apex. Okay, so these lone pairs have to be directly opposite each other so that you can have this square planar shape. Okay, if you connect the, the four fluorines, you'll see the square and all five of these atoms lie in the same plane. So now when we put all these electron geometries and molecular geomet geometries together, we have this huge table, table 11.1. .1. Now you have to memorize everything that's in this table. It looks scary, but if you break everything up piece by piece, you'll see that it's not scary at all. Okay, so let's take a look at the biggest section on here, the one with five electron groups. Okay, so here's our first column, fives all the way down. Now let's compare that first column with the second and third columns. You could see that with the number of bonding groups added to the number of lone pairs, they equal the number of electron groups. Okay, so the first three columns down. Now let's look at the next column. The number of electron groups tell you the electron geometry. So if we have fives all the way down in this one section, you know that the electron geometry for all four of those rows 
is trigonal bipyramidal. Okay, now the next one. Molecular geometry. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but not so much if you start off with trigonal bipyramidal. As you go down the column, you're adding a lone pair and taking away a bonding group. So the next molecular geometry that we have is seesaw. So if you know how to draw these molecular geometries, you'll know what the shapes are, the names of the shapes. Okay, our, so our seesaw molecular geometry actually looks like a seesaw. Next is T-shaped. Well, there you go. There's our letter T. And linear. All right, we formed a line here. Okay. Next would be bond angle. So our ideal, the ideal that we're starting off with is um, 120 degrees for all the equatorial positions and then 90 degrees going from axial to equatorial. And as we go down the column, they become less and less ideal because of the lone pairs that are being added. At the very end, if you know the um, degree angle for a line, then you'll know the bond angle for a linear molecular geometry, 180 degrees. So this section with five electron groups, that's the largest one that we have. If this seemed relatively easy to, to follow through and to memorize, then the rest of them are going to be even easier. So here's a review of what you need to do to figure out the molecular geometry of a molecule. So first you have to draw the Lewis structure. So don't forget those steps, starting with counting the number of valence electrons and ending with uh, calculating formal charges. Then count how many electron groups there are around the central atom and figure out of those electron groups, which ones are lone pairs and which ones are bonding groups. And don't forget that if you see one multiple bond, whether it's double bonds or triple bonds, if you see a double bond, for example, that is counted as one group. And then use table 11.1 .1 to figure out the molecular geometry of that molecule. Let's review a bit. So imagine that you have a molecule with six electron groups. So it looks like it has a hexagonal planar electron geometry. If two of the six groups are lone pairs, where would these lone pairs be located? Okay, so pause the video, take a look at the image that's given to you and your answer choices. Reason everything out when you're ready for the answer. Click play. Our answer here is letter C, positions one and four. So again, we're working with six electron groups, but we have this hypothetical two-dimensional hexagonal planar electron geometry. Now, we know that that doesn't exist. That's not part of our table 11.1 but we are still going to use our octahedral geometry. Now remember, if we need to have two lone pairs in our octahedral geometry, they have to be located directly across from each other. So with the choices that are given to us, our only pair of positions that work is positions one and, two, and four this pair, so letter C. Okay, next question, which statement is always true according to the Vesper theory? Pause the video, read through each sentence very carefully, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. 
Okay, so our answer here is letter D. Let's go back to what VSEPR actually stands for. Valence shell, electron, pair, repulsion. So with electron pairs, that includes the bonds, the shared electron pairs, and lone pairs, so non-bonding electron pairs. The only answer that incorporates those different types of electron groups is letter D. So all electron groups on the central atoms. When you're drawing out these Lewis structures, you have to remember that molecules are 3D. It's very difficult to understand the geometry when you're drawing them on a piece of paper which is two-dimensional. So how can we better visualize the 3D aspect of a molecule? Or we're going to have to use different types of lines. So for trying to indicate atoms that are in the same plane, we have to draw regular straight lines. There are going to be some atoms that are going to stick out of the paper towards you, and that's where you would need to use a solid wedge to connect the central atom to a terminal atom. And then for atoms that stick out away from you, you would then use a hashed wedge. So the straight line, obviously you've been using that already. This is how you would draw the hatched and the solid wedges. Okay, it's gonna take some practice for you to figure out which one of these to use, but when you've memorized and understood table 11.1, .1, then it's going to be um, very second nature to you in figuring out which type of wedge to use in your Lewis structure. Here are pictures of all the molecular geometries with solid lines, hatched, and solid wedges. You could see that for all of them, they all have atoms that are in the same plane as the paper. Okay, so with the linear, trigonal planar, and bent, all of those atoms are in the same plane. Once you hit tetrahedral, well, that's where you could see that one of the terminal atoms would be sticking out towards you, and then another one would be sticking out away from you the other three atoms are in the same plane as the piece of paper. Okay, now with a trigonal pyramidal, I feel like this is self-explanatory here. With trigonal bipyramidal, you can see which ones are axial and which ones are equatorial. Okay, these X's that are above and below the central atom A, those are your axial positions. And then the other three are equatorial. So one of the equatorial X's is pointed towards you, and there's another that's pointed away from you. Okay, let's get down to square planar. You could see that all five atoms are in the same plane. Okay, so it, this is almost as if um, you know you're looking at the square planar molecule from above. So you could see that nice X shape. Here I drew the Lewis structure for CH4. It's a tetrahedral. The bond angles for tetrahedral is 109.5. So when you look at the structure, don't think that the bond angle is 90 degrees. This is just a simplified version. A better way of drawing it is using these type of lines. So we still have the regular straight line. And we have a solid wedge 
and a hatched wedge. The solid lines mean that the atoms that are connected with the solid lines are in the same plane. This solid wedge, the bond is coming out of the page, or here in this case, out of the board. The hatched wedge, the bond is going into the board. So what do I mean by all that? Well, if you have a molecular model kit, you can take it out, you can create this model, you can make um, CH4, or you can follow along with my drawing here, and you can create something like this. You can see that the bond angle is more than 90 degrees. Again, it's 109.5. So now, what do I mean by in the same plane, coming out of the page, and going into the page? Well, just orient this model so that the green ball is lined up with the black ball and then is also lined up with the other green ball. Then take a piece of paper and take the edge, there we go, so that the, the edge of the paper lines up with these three atoms. Now you can see that these three atoms are in the same plane. The orange ball is coming out of the plane and then the blue ball is going back behind it. So if you're able to get a molecular model kit, I highly suggest you get it, play around with it, just so you'd have a better appreciation of these molecules in 3D. Also, you won't just be using it in Gen Chem, you'll definitely be using it a lot in organic chemistry. So you'll definitely get your money's worth. So let's try to predict the geometry and the bond angles and even draw this molecule, PCL3, with the solid lines, the hatched, and the solid wedges. OK, so follow the steps, same as before. Draw out your loose structures, follow those steps. Okay, pause the video while you do that. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so PCL3 has 26 valence electrons. This is our Lewis structure here. Okay, you can see that there are four electron groups around the central atom P. We have three bonding groups and one lone pair. We're going to use table 11.1 .1 to figure out the molecular geometry for PCL3. So we had four electron groups. So we're going to look at this part of the table. We had three bonding groups and one lone pair. So that's a tetrahedral electron geometry, but we want molecular geometry. So that is trigonal pyramidal. So here's how you would draw PCO3 if you wanted it to include the lone pair. Remember that ideally the tetrahedral bond angle would be 109.5. But because of the lone pair, it's going to be less than that. So if you want to say um, 107 degrees, similar to um, NH3, you could say that. Okay. Now, if you're going to draw this with the solid and hatched wedges, this is how you would draw it. Okay, with the P in the center and your, your three CL terminal atoms. 
go ahead and do the same thing for I, Cl4 minus. Please pause the video to draw out the Lewis structure and then count the number of electron groups so that you can figure out the geometry and the bond angles. And then try to draw this using the uh, straight lines, solid and hatched wedges. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so ICL4- minus has 36 valence electrons. You see that there are no double bonds here because we're dealing with halogens and normally they would just um, have single covalent bonds. The number of electron groups around the I would be six. So we have four bonds and two lone pairs. Looking at table 11.1, .1, we could see that we have a square planar molecule. So the two lone pairs are found directly across from each other. And you could see that we only need to draw this molecule with straight lines because all five atoms are found in the same plane. Okay, try this one. Do the same thing for CLNO. Pause the video, draw out the structure, reference table 11.1, .1, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so here's our structure. Everything works out. We use all the valence electrons. Each of these atoms have a complete octet and the formal charges work out. Now don't get confused with the way that it's drawn here. Yeah, it looks like that it's a line, but there are three electron groups. We have one, we have two, and here's our third one, the lone pair. Okay, so with three electron groups, with one of them being a lone pair, we actually have a bent-shaped molecule. Here we have I3 minus. So please pause the video, figure out the molecular geometry, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so here is the Lewis structure. Remember, when you see a minus sign here, we are dealing with a polyatomic ion. So don't forget to add an extra electron in your original tally. So we're working with 22 valence electrons. The molecular geometry here is linear. Even though we do have five electron groups, Three of them are lone pairs, and all you have to do is draw them with straight lines, and that shows that all three atoms are in the same plane. Now eventually you'll see molecules that are bigger and more complex, like amino acids, vitamins, lipids, and they're going to have many central atoms. Now what you would have to do if you need to figure out the molecular geometry, you're just going to look at each central atom one by one. And you're going to do the same thing. You're going to count how many electron groups, figure out which ones are bonds and which ones are lone pairs. So when you're given a Lewis structure like this, we're missing the two lone pairs on oxygen. So if you just count two electron groups here, you're going to think, okay, that's linear. Oxygen has a linear molecular structure. That is obviously incorrect. Okay, you'd have to draw the loose structure out like this, 
make sure to include the lone pairs. But if you draw it like this, be very careful again, because this carbon has a tetrahedral geometry, and we know that those bond angles are 109.5 degrees. Again, take a look at the central atoms one at a time when you have a very big structure like this. So you could see with the nitrogen, this carbon, and the oxygen, there are four electron groups. So if you were asked the electron geometry, then you would say tetrahedral for those three interior atoms. Now, if you were asked for the molecular geometry, well, this carbon is still tetrahedral. This nitrogen is um, trigonal pyramidal, and this oxygen is bent. Now look at this carbon here. What is the molecular geometry for this carbon? This is trigonal planar because we have three electron groups they're all bonds, there are no lone pairs. So this carbon right here, that's doubly bonded to the oxygen, is trigonal planar. Let's test your understanding now. We have CH3, NH2. What is the molecular geometry about the nitrogen? So pause the video draw out the Lewis structure and count the electron groups associated with nitrogen. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer is letter C, trigonal pyramidal. Here's our Lewis structure. Nitrogen has four electron groups. So this is something that you'll start getting used to. When you see nitrogen, with three bonds. It's got to have a lone pair so that it could have a complete octet. So when you see that, automatically think trigonal pyramidal as the molecular geometry. Okay, so instead of this C, this could be ammonia, NH3. Okay, same, same idea here. Got to make sure that there is a lone pair, and then we would have trigonal pyramidal. So in the last chapter, we took a look at bond polarity. And to figure out if a covalent bond is polar or not, we had to take a look at electronegativity and the difference between electronegativity values in the two atoms that are involved in the bond. Now we're gonna look at the polarity of molecules. So first, not only are we supposed to have polar bonds in the molecule, but the molecule also has to be asymmetrical. So this is where uh, molecular geometry comes in. So that we could figure out if one side of the molecule is more negative than the other side. With vector addition, it's not like you're gonna add different values together to get a resultant vector, okay? This is used once you know the polarity of the bonds in the molecule and the molecular geometry. You're gonna use those two things to figure out if the uh, molecule itself is polar or not. So let's take a look at example two. Okay, so let's say that our molecule is HF. Now pretend that there's a tug of war going on. Who's gonna win in this electron tug of war? The hydrogen or the fluorine? The fluorine would win because it is the most electronegative atom. So here in example two, fluorine would be vector B. Okay, so um, on the fluorine side, it'll be more negative 
and hydrogen would be more positive. So because of that, HF is going to be a polar molecule. Now if you take a look at example three, that's like saying we have F2. No side is going to be positive or negative because both fluorines are going to want to hog up the electrons equally. So the bond here is nonpolar. And because it's nonpolar, this molecule is also nonpolar. When we're looking at more complicated molecular geometries like tetrahedral, we have to pay attention to what the terminal atoms are. So let's take a look at CH4, methane. For simplicity's sake, we're going to say that a carbon singly bonded to a hydrogen has a polar bond. And we're saying that because the electronegativity values for carbon and hydrogen are different. Okay, now because all the terminal atoms are hydrogen, we have four equal polar bonds. They're all identical. Also, these bonds are in a tetrahedral arrangement. So all these bond angles are 109.5 degrees from each other. So these bonds would cancel out. And because of that, the molecule is nonpolar. Even though the bonds are polar, the canceling out would make the molecule itself nonpolar. Now, what if we had this? CH2, Cl2. And let's say that one chlorine is up here and the other chlorine is over here on the left-hand side. Okay, so we still have polar bonds, but chlorine is more electronegative compared to the hydrogen. So because of that, over here on this end of the molecule, this end is a little bit more negative and because of that, the other end is a little bit more positive. So because we have this asymmetry, this non-symmetry, along this plane here, our molecule is polar. Some physical properties that are dependent on polarity would be boiling points and solubilities. I'm sure you've heard of like dissolves like before. So uh, a very classic example of that would be oil and water. If you put those two things in the same container, you'll see that they would not mix at all. And that's because water is a polar molecule and oil is nonpolar. So here we have two water molecules and they are attracted to each other with this intermolecular force. And that's a force that's found between molecules. Now with this water molecule, the positive end, which is hydrogen, is attracted to the negative end of the other water molecule, which is oxygen. Now, with keeping like dissolves like in mind, what types of compounds can dissolve in water? Anything else that's polar, anything else that has a positive end, negative end, or ions, salts like NaCl, they can dissolve in water. Okay, so here, we have oil and water not mixing with each other in the same container. Yeah, there are little oil droplets here. That's fine, but for the most part, you could see that they are not mixed. They are not mixed. The oil down here is still separated from the water. 
Okay. Now let's say that we sprinkle a little bit of NaCl on top of this oil and we shake it up. Eventually the oil and water are going to separate out again but then you'll find the NaCl dissolved in the water portion. Why? Because NaCl can be broken up into its ions, and ions are charged particles, so they'll want to dissolve in something that is polar. Here is a soap molecule that has a polar head and a nonpolar tail. This is how you could get clean, okay? So if you just try to wash off grease on your hands with just water, you're really not gonna take a whole lot of grease off because again, oil and water do not mix. Polar and nonpolar things do not mix. So you're gonna need something like soap that has a polar head that's attracted to the water and a nonpolar end that's attracted to the oil that's on your hands. So if you lather up the, the soap really well and you scrub, scrub, scrub your hands, when you run the water through, not only would the soap molecules wash away, but the oil molecules will also wash away because they're going to be attracted to the nonpolar tail of the soap molecule. We have to follow some steps when we're trying to figure out if a molecule is polar or not. So the first step, draw the Lewis structure and then determine the molecular geometry. Second step, we're specifically going to look at the bonds in the molecule. Then we're going to figure out if they're polar or not. If there are no polar bonds, then guess what? The process is done. The molecule is nonpolar. But if there are polar bonds, then you're going to have to draw arrows towards the more electronegative atom. When you've drawn out all your arrows, then you have to figure out the net dipole moment. Is one end going to be negative and the other positive? Well, yeah, that's where you have to sum up all the vectors. If you have an evenly split tug of war, then the molecule is nonpolar. But if one side wins out, then you have a molecule that is polar. For me, if I'm trying to figure out if a molecule is polar or not, I'm going to try to find a plane of asymmetry. So if I cut a molecule a certain way, am I going to have mirror images or are they going to look completely different from each other? So let's take a look at HCl. So our first step is already done. We have our Lewis structure, even though it's not complete, we don't see lone pairs there, but that's fine. Now let's take a look at the bond. Is the HCl bond polar? The answer there is yes. Chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen. So the chlorine is going to be the negative end of the bond and hydrogen would be the positive end. Okay, so we know that the bond is polar. So that's a yes. Now, is the molecule polar? This is where we look for asymmetry. There might be a plane where this molecule is not symmetrical. So, okay, let's say that I cut the molecule like this, straight in half, horizontally. Are my two halves symmetrical? The answer is yes. Okay, so now what if I cut it this way, vertically? Do I have symmetrical parts? No, I do not. So I've created a plane of asymmetry. So my two pieces are not symmetrical. So that means that this molecule is polar. This molecule is polar. I did find 
a plane of asymmetry. Let's take a look at carbon dioxide now. Okay, is the OC double bond polar? So let's just take a look at one of these double bonds. Is this bond polar? The answer is yes, because oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon. So that means that this double bond is also polar. Okay, so we're drawing our arrows. Now is the molecule polar? Okay, so right here we could see that the pull is the same and they're happening in opposite directions. So the answer here is no. The molecule is nonpolar. Okay, now let's take a look at symmetry, another way of, in figuring out the answer to the second question. What happens if I cut carbon dioxide horizontally? Is the top portion a mirror image of the bottom portion? The answer is yes. Now what if I cut it vertically? Is the left-hand side a mirror image of the right-hand side? The answer is yes. So I cut it two ways. In both ways, I have symmetry. So the answer here for the second question is no. I could not find um, a plane of asymmetry. So this molecule is nonpolar. Let's take a look at water. So is this OH bond polar? The answer is yes, because oxygen is more electronegative. And so we could say the same thing for this bond. Okay, so we draw our arrows there. Now, is the molecule polar? Just looking at the arrows, we see that the arrows are pointed in one direction. Okay, so the arrows are not can canceling out. So oxygen is going to be the negative side. Hydrogens, the hydrogens would be the positive end. Okay, now let's take a look at symmetry. If I cut the water molecule like this, we have symmetry. The left-hand side looks like the right-hand side. If I cut it like this, now we have asymmetry. We have asymmetry now. The top portion does not look like the bottom portion. So the answer to this question is yes. I found a, a plane of asymmetry. So yes, this molecule is polar. Let's check for understanding. So we have a molecule that has three identical polar bonds in a trigonal planar molecular geometry. Is this molecule polar? So think this through, pause the video, draw things out if you need to, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer here is B, the molecule is nonpolar. Okay, so yeah, we do have polar bonds. They are identical. So uh, pretend that the magnitude of these vectors are the same. If we had a central atom here, and we're, you know, thinking about our pretend tug of war, the central atom is not going to move at all. Why? Because the polar bonds are identical and the bond angles are all the same. They're all 120 degrees. Okay, so here we have ammonia, NH3. Determine if ammonia is polar. So think back to what your steps are. Pause the video, draw out your Lewis structure, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so here's our Lewis structure. 
we need to figure out the molecular geometry. Okay, so we have four, we have four electron groups. Three of them are bonds, one is a lone pair. Okay, so we need to figure out if the bonds are polar bonds. So you don't, you don't have to memorize these electronegativity values. You just need to know that nitrogen is more electronegative. Okay, so because we know that, the bonds are in fact polar. So because the bonds are polar and we already drew our vector arrows, we're gonna have to add those arrows uh, together to figure out the net dipole moment. And sure enough, all those arrows are pointed to nitrogen. Not only is it more electronegative, but it's also got a lone pair. Don't forget about the lone pair. So overall, the arrow is gonna be pointed up. So the nitrogen end is gonna be a little bit more negative compared to the hydrogen end. Okay, and this should make sense because our molecular geometry is trigonal pyramidal. Now figure out if CF4 is polar. Pause the video, draw out your Lewis structure, figure out the molecular geometry, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so here is the Lewis structure. This is a tetrahedral because we have four electron groups. I didn't put in the lone pairs because they're, they're not important right now. We're trying to figure out uh, polarity of the molecule. So now, um, the next step is to figure out if our bonds, if our bonds are polar or not. So we have carbon singly bonded to fluorine. We know fluorine is the most electronegative element. So all four of these bonds are polar. Okay, so we're gonna draw our arrows. Here they are. Now the next step, is this molecule polar? The answer is no. Why? because all of our bonds are identical. All of our terminal atoms are fluorine. Also, all of our bond angles are the same. So think about the um, pretend tug of war. This carbon is not gonna go anywhere because the magnitude of the vector, the strength of the bond, the polarity of the bond um, is the same in all four bonds. Also, the bond angles, all four bond angles, are 109.5 degrees. So CF4 is nonpolar. Now, there are several problems with the Lewis bonding theory. The first one deals with bond strength and length, and that's what we saw in the previous chapter. We can only say that triple bonds are the strongest of the three bonds. Then it would be double bonds, and then single bonds would be the weakest of the three. That's all we could say. We can't say anything about uh, numerical predictions or you know proportions, nothing like that. We can only give general trends of the bond strength and bond length. Another issue would be bond angles. So we know earlier in the chapter, there are ideal bond angles. But once you throw some lone pairs into the molecule, then it's harder to figure out what those bond angles actually are. Another problem deals with resonance structures. In the previous chapter, we had to draw many different resonance structures with the double-headed arrows to represent the resonance hybrid. 
Another issue is magnetic behavior of molecules. So with O2 specifically, if you draw out the Lewis structure, you'll see that all the electrons are paired up as if it was diamagnetic. But experimentally, we know that O2 is paramagnetic. So now we have a new bond theory to study, valence bond theory, and that involves quantum mechanics. So going back to a couple of chapters ago with s orbitals p, d, and f, okay, so we're going to see those again, and we're going to see what happens when those orbitals interact to form a bond. Now, even though this is a new bonding theory, the whole idea of a stable system can be seen. So a chemical bond would form if the energy of the system is lowered. So when that happens, then we know that we can form some bonds. Here we have two hydrogen atoms trying to interact with each other. In order for a bond to form between these two atoms, there's going to have to be some kind of overlap, some kind of interaction between the two different s orbitals. Okay, so let's take a look at position one here on our graph. We can see that the energy is a little bit less than zero, which is okay, but that doesn't do anything for us because there is no overlap between the two orbitals. So this is no good here. Now let's bring the um, atoms a little bit closer together. So we see that there is some overlap and the energy is decreasing. So our system is becoming a little bit more stable. Let's see what happens when we bring these atoms a little bit closer together. Okay, let's take a look at our energy. It's, it's really low now and we got some more overlap. What happens when we push those atoms even closer together? Okay, so now we have this, but uh-oh, let's take a look at our energy. It shot up real high. Okay, it's at zero or maybe even um, a positive number if we take a closer look at it. So position four is no good. There's repulsion going on. Um, most likely between the two positively charged nuclei. They don't want to be that close together. So where is the best spot? Right here in position three. The nuclei are still close together, so there's going to be some repulsion there, but there is enough electron overlap to mitigate that repulsion. Okay, so the distance between the two nuclei is the bond length. The energy released to form that bond is bond energy. Okay, so let's answer this question here. What is a chemical bond? So looking specifically at valence bond theory, let's answer this question. What is a chemical bond? Pause the video, look through your answer choices very carefully, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Looking specifically at valence bond theory, our answer is letter B. You may have chosen letter D but that only works if we're looking at the Lewis bonding theory, where electrons are being shared. Still looking at valence bond theory, let's try to form H2S. So here we have the orbital diagrams for hydrogen and sulfur, but with sulfur, we're only looking at the valence electrons. Okay, so for us to form a bond, we need to have half-filled orbitals and we need them to overlap. 
So with hydrogen, that works out. So we're only looking at the 1s orbital, and we see that um, they're half filled. Both of them are half filled. With sulfur, we have two orbitals that are half filled. So the 1s orbital from the hydrogen is going to overlap with one of the 3p orbitals from sulfur. And we could do that again, and that's how we can form H2s. So we know that carbon needs to form four bonds. And therein lies the problem. If we follow the same method that we saw in sulfur and apply it to carbon, then we won't be able to see four bonds forming with carbon. So we have to take a look at the electron configuration for carbon to see why this is a big problem. Remember that we need to have overlapping half-filled orbitals in order to form a bond in this new theory. So with hydrogen, we're good there. With carbon, we only have two half-filled orbitals. So using the same method as before, carbon should only form two bonds, but that's not what we see in reality. So there's something wrong here in this bonding theory. There's something that's missing. So in order for carbon to form four bonds, there needs to be some mixing of these orbitals. In other words, the orbitals have to hybridize first, and then carbon can form the four bonds. So before we get into hybridization, we have to have these three main concepts down of the balance bond theory. So we have our S, P, D, and F orbitals. And in those orbitals, we have our valence electrons. Next, we have to have some overlap between the atomic orbitals, the half-filled atomic orbitals, in order for a chemical bond to form. Okay, And those two electrons need to have opposite spins. So if we're going to draw arrows as a review, one arrow is going to be pointed up, the other one's going to be pointed down. Then, depending on the geometry of the interacting orbitals, we could actually figure out the shape of our molecule. So hybridization is the mixing of the different atomic orbitals to form a new set of orbitals. And those new set of orbitals are going to have the same energy, so they will be degenerate. Okay, This is important because as we form more bonds, the potential energy of the system lowers. And so that means that the system is more stable. So here are the new orbitals. We, we don't have S's, we don't have P's or D's anymore. We have hybrids of those original atomic orbitals. So um, in the next slide, I'll show you how these different orbitals are produced. Okay, so the first rule in atomic orbitals is the number of atomic orbitals you combine is going to be the same number of hybrid orbitals that you produce. So if we take a look at carbon, okay, this is the energy diagram for carbon. It has four valence electrons. It has one 2s orbital and three 2p orbitals. You can see that the 2s orbital is lower in energy compared to the, two, the three 2p orbitals. Now look at what we're going to do. We're going to mix these four atomic orbitals, and then we'll have four hybrid orbitals. 
Now, what are the names of these hybrid orbitals? sp3. So this one orbital is called sp3. This one is also called sp3, and so on and so forth. They're not s's, they're not p's anymore. They have hybridized. Okay, so again, because we mixed four atomic orbitals, we have four hybrid orbitals. And the name, the name tells you how many of each type of orbital we originally mixed. Okay, so with the S, we only have one S orbital, so there's no superscript there in the name. With the P, you could see that has a superscript of three, and that tells you that three P orbitals were originally mixed. Now take a look at the energy. Take a look at the energy. It is a little bit higher than the 2s, but it's also lower than the 2p orbitals. Point number two would tell us the molecular geometry. And that all depends on how many hybrid orbitals we created. So here we have four sp3 hybrid orbitals. So that means that we can have four electron groups. Now think back to table 11.1. .1. What is the electron geometry for a molecule that has four electron groups? That would be tetrahedral. Now point three, I mentioned a little bit already. When we hybridize the original atomic orbitals, we are trying to lower the energy of the system. So with hybridization, we're trying to obtain the lowest overall energy for the molecule. So now we have four, we have four sp3 hybrid orbitals. And in each of these four orbitals, we have one electron. So we got our half-filled orbitals. Now carbon is able to form four bonds. Now, how do these hybrid orbitals look? Well, they're sort of a mixture of our s orbital and our p orbitals. They are bilobed, but one of the lobes is a little bit bigger than the other. And you can see that all four of these lobes are identical. Now again, don't forget, when you see this orbital, it's not an s orbital. It's not a p orbital. It is one sp3 orbital. Okay, and because we mixed four atomic orbitals, we have four hybrid orbitals. Now, what happens when we try to put them together? We have a tetrahedral. And look at the bond angle, 109.5. Look familiar? So when you see sp3 hybridization, you know that you're dealing with a central atom that has four electron groups. So we have a tetrahedral geometry, okay? So here, if you look very carefully, this is CH4, CH4. Here is NH3, okay? So the N, even though it's bonding with three H atoms, it is still sp3 hybridized. Why? Because the lone pair has to go somewhere. The lone pair is going to use one of the hybrid orbitals. Okay, so N is still sp3 hybridized, just like the carbon. Now what you have to remember is that hydrogen cannot hybridize. It cannot hybridize. So it still remains a 1s orbital. When you see a central atom with three electron groups, 
you would know that those electron groups have sp2 hybridization. So there were three atomic orbitals that were mixed to form this new hybridization. One s orbital and two p orbitals. The other p orbital, that last, that third one, remains unhybridized. That's going to be used for something else. So just like with Lewis bonding, when we have three electron groups, our geometry is trigonal planar. So all the atoms, all the electron groups are found in the same plane. And the bond angles that we see are 120 degrees. Now here, we're going to see two different types of orbital overlap. One type of overlap would give us sigma bonds, and we see that with our hybrid orbitals. The other type of overlap would give us pi bonds, and that's where we would use the unhybridized p orbital. We see here that only three standard atomic orbitals are going to be mixed and they're going to hybridize into three sp2 hybrid orbitals. Again, it's going to be, they are going to be lower in energy compared to the 2p orbitals, but still be a little bit higher than the 2s orbital. The unhybridized p orbital is still hanging out up here with high energy. Here are the three sp2 hybrid orbitals. And when they come together, they form a molecule that has a molecular geometry that is trigonal planar. All the atoms, all the electron groups are found on the same plane. Because we have this unhybridized p orbital, we're going to see two different types of overlap. We're going to see two different types of orbital interaction. So before we get to uh, those two different overlaps, we need to know what an internuclear axis is. So think of a line that connects the two nuclei that share a bond. That is the internuclear axis. So the overlap, that the overlaps that we're going to see would be based on the orbitals being aligned along this axis, or they'd be situated parallel to each other. So they look perpendicular to the internuclear axis. So when the overlap occurs along the internuclear axis, we would have a sigma bond. So here we go. Here's one nucleus, and we're going to draw a line to the other nucleus. And here we have the internuclear axis. If the overlap occurs along this axis, then we have a sigma bond. And any combination of orbitals can be used here. We could have, you know, the regular atomic orbitals uh, overlapping with each other. We could have just the hybrid orbitals or, um, you know, an S or a hybrid orbital overlapping. As long as the overlap occurs on the internuclear axis. The other overlap that we would see would result in a pi bond. So here we're going to draw our internuclear axis again. Okay. This time our overlap is going to occur above and below the internuclear axis. So our p orbitals, this p orbital is from one atom, this p orbital is from another atom. These two orbitals would need to be parallel to each other and perpendicular 
to the internuclear axis. So that what we get in the end is two areas of electron density above and below the axis. Now, although we have two areas of overlap, this is still considered one pi bond. You could see our electron pair here. This is still considered one pi bond. Now, this arrangement of the electron density is not ideal. Why? Because the nuclei are positively charged. If they're very close together, there's going to be some repulsion. If the bond was found between the nuclei, then the charges would become more stable. But we don't have that here with the pi bond. The uh, electron density is found above and below the internuclear axis. So because of that, the pi bond would be weaker than the sigma bond. Here we have the Lewis structure and the orbital scheme of formaldehyde. Let's take a look at this single bond between carbon and hydrogen. We see that it is a sigma bond, so the overlap occurs along the internuclear axis. Don't forget, hydrogens uh, do not hybridize, so these orbitals are just your regular S atomic orbitals. Now let's take a look at this double bond here between carbon and oxygen. We could see that one of those bonds is a sigma bond, but then the other one is a pi bond. Why? Because we could see the overlap above and below this internuclear axis, which is represented by this green plane here. So to form sigma bonds, we can have any combination of orbital as long as the overlap occurs along the internuclear axis. With pi bonds, however, we're only limited to unhybridized p orbitals. Now also, when you look at a single bond, you have to remember that it is a sigma bond. When you see a double bond, one of those bonds is sigma, the other one is a pi bond. If a molecule only has single bonds, remember single bonds are sigma bonds, if there are only single bonds, then that molecule is able to rotate. And normally you would see that as you uh, increase the temperature of the system. Okay, not only would molecules vibrate, but they could also rotate. But if there's a double bond somewhere, that pi bond is going to restrict the rotation. Here we have 1,2-dichloroethane. A and E tells us that we only have single bonds here. And we also have 1,2-dichloroethene. E and E tells us, this, tells us that there's a double bond somewhere. So again, if we only have single bonds, then this molecule can rotate. So right now, uh, the two chlorines are, are pointed downward. Well, there's a possibility for this chlorine to rotate upward. So uh, the atom down here would be the hydrogen and up here would be the chlorine. There would be free rotation about this single bond. But if there is a pi bond, there would be no rotation whatsoever. Okay, the pi bond would restrict the rotation. The only way for this bond to uh, rotate is if the pi bond was broken. Now, if you break the pi bond, then we're going to have a completely different chemical. 
Here we have two different forms of 1,2-dichloroethene. We have the cis ver version and the trans version. So when you see cis, that means the same. In this case, the chlorines are on the same side of the double bond. When you see the word trans, think of a cross. So here the chlorines are found across or on the opposite sides of the double bond. These two molecules are isomers. Why? Because the atom connectivity is different between these two. These are not resonance structures. Remember, resonance only involves the movement of electrons, not the change in atom connectivity. Okay, so here with these two molecules, these two isomers, they actually have different physical properties because of the arrangement of the chlorines. Okay, so of these two isomers, which molecule is polar? So pause the video, reason it out, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer is letter A, the cis version of this isomer. You should remember that Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. So if we divide up the molecule this way, you'll see that on the chlorine side, that'll be the more negative side. And so because of that, up here with the hydrogens, they'll be a little bit more positive. So the cis version is the polar molecule. Now we have one of the carbons circled. What is the molecular geometry of this circled carbon? Pause the video, take some time to figure out, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer is B, trigonal planar. We need to count the number of electron groups associated with this carbon. So we have one, two, three, and three electron groups tells us trigonal planar. Now, what is the hybridization of this circled carbon? Pause the video, figure it out, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer is B, sp2. So here with hybridization, we have to count how many electron groups there are. So we have one, two, three. So we have to pick the hybridization that corresponds to three electron groups. And that is letter B. And we could tell based on the superscripts or lack thereof, we know that two p orbitals were used. And because we only have s here, we know that one s orbital was used. So one plus two equals three hybrid orbitals. So the answer is letter B. With sp hybridization, we have two electron groups. So sp hybrid orbitals, they're formed by combining one s orbital and one p orbital. We'd end up with a linear shape and a bond angle of 180 degrees. Now take a look at what happens here with hcn. You see this triple bond? It's made up of one sigma bond and two pi bonds. So those two unhybridized p orbitals in carbon are going to be used to form the triple bond with nitrogen. 
okay? So one sp orbital is going to form a sigma bond with hydrogen. Remember, this orbital remains unhybridized, so this is just a regular s orbital. The second sp orbital is going to form a sigma bond with nitrogen. Now let's take a look at the pi bonds. So let's just take a look at this top pi bond here. So we have one p orbital from carbon and another one from nitrogen. Not drawn very well, but hopefully you get the idea. Here's our overlap. So that is one pi bond, even though there are two areas of overlap. Okay, so now let's take a look at the second pi bond. We're going to need another set of p orbitals to create another overlap. So when we have a triple bond, remember that one of those bonds is going to be sigma. The other two are going to be pi bonds. Here we have the Lewis structure and the valence bond model for acetylene. So really we're gonna focus on the triple bond between the two carbons. We can easily see the three sigma bonds. So here's one, two, three sigma bonds. Let's figure out the pi bonds. Okay, so here's one part of one pi bond, and here's the other part. Okay, these Overlaps are found above and below the internuclear axis. Now, what about the second pi bond? Well, that's this guy here. Hopefully you could see this one. And it corresponds to this guy back here. Now, if you kind of rotate it a little bit, the, these two are technically above and below the internuclear axis as well. Now, when you compare these two pi bonds, they are perpendicular to each other. Now, what happens when we throw a d orbital? Well, now we're going to have a molecule with five electron groups. So that is a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. We're going to see these geometries again. It all depends on how many lone pairs there are. And you're going to see these bond angles, same as before. So really, the only difference is this notation of the hybrid orbital. When we see six electron groups on an atom, we would know that those orbitals are sp3d2 hybridized. Again, when you add up the superscripts, we would come up with six as our answer. So that tells you six electron groups. And don't forget about Vesper theory again. That is an octahedral geometry. And depending on how many lone pairs there are, you could see square pyramid or square planar. Here in table 11.3, you can see the similarities between valence bond theory and Vesper theory. You'd have to count the number of electron groups associated to the central atom. We have the same bond angles and we use the same molecular geometries. So to figure out hybridization, we're going to have to use the skills that we learned from earlier in the video. So the first step is to draw out the Lewis structure. 
Then we're going to count electron groups so that we can figure out the geometry using Vesper theory. Also, we're going to use those same number of electron groups to figure out hybridization. So that's our sp3, sp2. Then we're going to draw out the orbitals to see how they overlap with each other. And then from there, we're going to figure out how many sigma bonds we have and how many pi bonds we have in our molecule. Let's test for our understanding. How many sp3 hybrid orbitals result from the hybridization of 1s and 3p orbitals? So pause the video if you need to to figure this question out. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. Our answer here is four. So remember, however many atomic orbitals you mix, that's how many hybrid orbitals you produce. So let's say that the question did not tell you how many S and P orbitals were mixed. We'll just take a look at the type of hybrid orbital that's given, add the superscripts or lack thereof, so three plus Nothing here uh, tells you that only one s orbital was used. So one plus three is four. So our answer here is letter D. According to valence bond theory, why is a double bond not simply twice as strong as a single bond? So pause the video, take a close look at the table that's given and also your answer choices. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. All right, so the answer here is letter A. A double bond is made up of one sigma bond and one pi bond. Because of the way that these two bonds are formed, the pi bond is the weaker of the two. Why? Because the pi bond, in the pi bond, the overlap is found above and below the internuclear axis, which is less stable compared to the sigma bond. Now the overlap of the sigma bond is found along the internuclear axis. So that negative charge in, in that bond would stabilize the two positively charged nuclei. That's why the sigma bond is the stronger of the two. Okay, so what is the hybridization of the carbon in carbon dioxide? Pause the video, go through the steps, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so our answer here is letter A, SP hybridized. Here's the Lewis structure. Now, you could just stop here because you would really just need to count how many electron groups there are with the carbon, and we see two. We have one double bond here and another double bond here. So we have two electron groups. So that corresponds to sp. Carbon is sp hybridized. Well, let's say that we want to go a little bit further. If you take a look at one double bond, you should remember that one of these bonds is sigma and the other one is pi. So if that's true for this double bond on the left-hand side, it must also be true for the one on the right-hand side. So one of these bonds in the double bonds are sigma, the other two would be pi. And remember, in order to form a pi bond, you would need unhybridized p orbitals. 
and that's what we would see here. Not all the p orbitals were used in hybridization. So how about you try writing out the hybridization and the bonding scheme for BRF3. Pause the video, follow the steps, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the first step is to write out the Lewis structure. So you need to know how many valence electrons you're working with, and that is 28. BR can have an expanded octet. The electron geometry is trigonal bipyramidal because we see five electron groups. So that's three bonds here and two lone pairs. So now what's the hybridization based on the number of electron groups in table 11.3, we would have sp3d hybridization. So you don't have to draw out the orbitals if you don't want to, but it can be very helpful in figuring out where lone pairs would reside if the question asked for it, okay? So we don't have to worry about pi bonds because we don't see any double bonds or triple bonds. We know that there are three sigma bonds because we see three single bonds. Now, what about these two lone pairs? In which orbital would they reside? Well, they would have to be in a hybrid orbital. Remember, it's part of that five electron group. And we already said that those orbitals are sp3d hybridized. Okay, so three of those hybrid orbitals are used to create sigma bonds. And then the other two are used to house the lone pairs. Now let's do the same thing for acetylaldehyde. Write out the hybridization and the bonding scheme. So pause the video. Please try this out yourself and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so you had to draw out the Lewis structure using the 18 valence electrons. And here you could see that there are two central atoms. So you would need to know the geometries of the two carbons found in the middle of the molecule. Okay, so here, on the, with this uh, left-handed, uh, left side, carbon, we see that there are four electron groups. There are four bonds. So this geometry is tetrahedral. The rightmost carbon has three electron groups. So this carbon is trigonal planar. Now let's figure out hybridization using table 11.3. For something that has four electron groups, that would be sp3 hybridized. So the leftmost carbon is sp3 hybridized. The rightmost carbon would be sp2 hybridized to represent the three electron groups. Okay, so here are the diagrams. Let's also count how many sigma bonds and pi bonds there are. So remember, all single bonds are sigma bonds. And with multiple bonds, one of them is a sigma bond. So how many sigma bonds are there in this molecule? We have one, two, 
three, four, five, six. Six sigma bonds, and how many pi bonds? We've got one. Here we have five molecules. So please pause the video and determine the hybridizations for each interior atom in these molecules. When you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so I hope you drew out the Lewis structures. If you just took a look at XEF4 and thought that it was the same thing as CH4, then you are sorely mistaken. Why? Because CH4 is tetrahedral. It's only got four electron groups. So that is sp3 hybridized. But if you drew the Lewis structure for XEF4, you see that it's not tetrahedral. It actually has six electron groups. So what's the hybridization for six electron groups? sp3d2. So if you need to determine hybridization, and you're just given the formula, do yourselves a favor and draw out the Lewis structure. Same thing for letter B. You probably thought that this was linear. Yeah, it is linear, but XE can have an expanded octet. So hopefully you didn't forget any of the lone pairs we see that there are five electron groups, so the hybridization for Xe is sp3d. Here's the Lewis structure for letter C. We're only going to take a look at one of the carbons because it's um, identical in terms of connectivity with the other one. So this carbon here has three electron groups, one, two, three. So it is sp2 hybridized. And that should make sense because we have a double bond here. So one of them is a pi bond and you need unhybridized p orbitals to form pi bonds. Here's the Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. We saw this before. We have two electron groups, one, two. So this carbon is sp hybridized. And I3 minus, we have five electron groups on the central I. So that is sp3d hybridized. Let's take a look at this molecule. How many sigma bonds are there in this molecule? So pause the video, make sure you count carefully. When you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer is nine. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sigma bonds. What is the hybridization of the nitrogen? Please pause the video so you could figure it out. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. The answer is A, sp3. Let's count how many electron groups there are. So I have one, two, three, four. So the hybridization that corresponds to four electron groups is 
sp3. Okay, so we have one lone pair on an oxygen that is circled. Name the orbital in which the indicated lone pair is found. So pause the video, think it through. When you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer here is sp3. So let's count the number of electron groups. We have one, two, three, four. So you have to remember that lone pairs are found in hybridized orbitals. So here, because there are four electron groups on oxygen, this lone pair is found in an sp3 hybridized orbital. So there are still some problems with valence bond theory. Yeah, we understand bond strengths better. We know now why double bonds are not simply double the bond energy of a single bond. Okay, now we know that um, pi bonds are weaker than sigma bonds, and that's what makes up double bonds and triple bonds. But we still don't know how to explain delocalization or resonance, and also the magnetic behavior of O2. Here we have the Lewis structure and the bonding scheme for O2. We could see that in both of these images, the electrons are paired up, but liquid O2 is attracted to a magnetic field, and that can only be seen in something that is paramagnetic. In other words, unpaired electrons should be found on O2. So we need to look at another bonding theory to explain resonance and this effect on oxygen towards a magnetic field. To explain the magnetic behavior of O2 and the delocalization of electrons, we'll be taking a look at molecular orbital theory. And here, we're going to revisit Schrodinger's wave equation. We're not going to be solving for anything, but we will be using s orbitals and p orbitals. We'll use those atomic orbitals and combine them to form molecular orbitals. And again, we're not going to actually really solve for anything. Here in this theory, we're going to take some guesses and see if a molecule will actually form. We'll be using a method in this new theory called linear combination of atomic orbitals. That just means we're going to take all the s orbitals and p orbitals involved and combine them to form molecular orbitals. So just like with valence bonding theory, when we're um, combining atomic orbitals to make hybrid orbitals, however many atomic orbitals we started off with, that's how many molecular orbitals we'll end with. And because we're going to be working with wave functions, we're going to see some constructive and destructive combinations of these orbitals. When two waves with the same frequency interfere constructively, the resulting wave would have an increased amplitude. So here, when two atomic orbitals combine constructively, a bonding molecular orbital would be produced. So just like with the other two bonding theories, the energy of the system would decrease and the bond would be very stable. Here, the electron uh, density is along the internuclear axis. 
So this molecular orbital is called sigma 1s. When two waves undergo complete destructive interference, the result would be a node. So here, when two atomic orbitals combine destructively, an antibonding molecular orbital would be produced. The energy of the system would increase and the bond would be unstable. Now here, the electron density is not along the internuclear axis. It's found mostly outside of the nuclei. And the molecular orbital name is called sigma star 1s. You could see that when two atomic orbitals combine constructively, the resulting molecular bonding orbital is lower in energy. When the atomic orbitals combine destructively, the antibonding orbital is higher in energy. So this antibonding orbital would make the bond um, more unstable. So we're always going to have electrons in bonding molecular orbitals. We might have electrons in antibonding molecular orbitals. It all depends on how many valence electrons we're working with. So if we have a large enough number of antibonding electrons, then the bond becomes more unstable and the more likely that molecule will not exist. So here's our molecular orbital diagram. Here, we're trying to figure out if H2 exists. Now we know that it exists. We know that hydrogen gas is a diatomic molecule but we're going to use this example to help us understand molecular orbital theory. So in order to form H2, we're going to need two hydrogen atoms. And here they are. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. They're going to bring to the table two atomic orbitals, which are both 1s. Now remember, if we're going to combine two atomic orbitals, we're going to produce two molecular orbitals. One of them is going to be a bonding sigma 1s. The second one is going to be an anti-bonding sigma star 1s. Now take a look at their energy values. If the 1s orbital starts off here in the middle, then the bonding orbital will be lower in energy than the atomic orbitals, and the antibonding will be higher in energy compared to the atomic orbitals. Okay, so now, how many valence electrons are we working with? Well, one hydrogen atom has one valence electron, but because we have two H atoms, we're working with two valence electrons. Now we got to fill in this middle portion of the picture. We got to fill up the molecular orbitals using the two valence electrons, but we're also going to use Aufbau's principle. So we have to start off with the orbital in the lowest energy level. So that's our sigma 1s. One arrow is pointed up, the other arrow is pointed down. And there we go. This is our orbital diagram. We have two electrons in the bonding molecular orbital and zero electrons in the antibonding molecular orbital. Okay, so we were able to fill out that picture. What do we do next? How do we know if H2 actually exists? Well, now we have to figure out something called bond order. And that's where we have to use the number of electrons in the bonding and antibonding orbitals. 
So here is the equation that we need to use. The number of bonding electrons minus the number of anti-bonding electrons divided by 2. So we're only going to look at the, the valence electrons. It's OK if this number is a fraction. If the bond order is 0, then we know that it is unstable and that molecule will not exist. And the higher the bond order, then the stronger and shorter the bond. So let's think about um, H2 again. We had two bonding electrons and zero anti-bonding electrons. So our bond order for that example is 1. So according to this information, H2 can exist. So we can use this theory to figure out if some molecules are paramagnetic or diamagnetic. Looking back to our previous example, H2, is H2 paramagnetic or diamagnetic? We saw that we were only working with two electrons, so they must be paired. So H2 is a diamagnetic molecule. Okay, so now let's take a look at HE2. Let's try to see if this molecule actually exists. We have our two atomic orbitals, again working with just one s. We're working with four valence electrons here. Now we have to fill in the molecular orbitals, starting with the one um, at the lowest energy, which is sigma 1s. So we fill two electrons there. And then our last two in the antibonding orbital, sigma star 1s. So does this molecule exist? Well, let's take a look at the bond order. We have two electrons in um, sigma 1s and minus two electrons in sigma star 1s, all divided by 2. So that's 0 divided by 2. Our bond order is 0. So this bond actually does not exist. So the molecule is unstable. It, it really just doesn't exist. So remember, if you calculate a bond order of 0 or even a negative number, the bond in that molecule does not exist. So let's test for our understanding. What is the bond order for a second period diatomic molecule containing three electrons in antibonding molecular orbitals and six electrons in bonding molecular orbitals? So pause the video, use the equation, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so the answer is B, 1.5. So it's just easy arithmetic here. We have six bonding electrons minus three antibonding electrons. Six minus three is three. And then three divided by two is 1.5. So since this is a positive number, the bond exists. So this molecule, whatever it is, actually exists. Now we're going to take a look at H2 minus. You're going to figure out the bond order using molecular orbital theory, and then see if the bond in H2 minus is stronger or weaker than the bond in H2. So pause the video. Draw out that molecular orbital diagram. Fill out the orbitals with the valence electrons. And when you're ready for the answer, click play.
Okay, so here's the diagram. We're working with one H atom and one H minus ion. Okay, this minus sign tells you that there is an extra electron somewhere. So you gotta make sure that you depict that um, in the atomic orbital side, either one of these. Okay, so we're working with three valence electrons. We fill out our first two in the sigma 1s orbital, and then our last third one in the sigma star 1s. Okay, so now let's use our equation for bond order. We have two electrons in a bonding orbital and one electron in antibonding. So our bond order here for H2 minus is plus one. So this tells us that the bond in H2 does exist, but it's weaker than the bond in H2. We saw this example before and, and we figured out that the bond order there is one. Now we're going to look at elements in the second row of the periodic table. So here we have lithium. We're going to see if we can make Li2. We're working with two valence electrons. And so we just fill them in um, the sigma 2s bonding molecular orbital now. If you do the math quickly in your head, the bond order here is one. So a bond does exist. So that means that Li2 does also exist. Now with period two, we're not just working with two S orbitals. We're also going to see two P orbitals. So here we have 2 2p orbitals that are going to constructively combine and here we have the electron density along the internuclear axis so this is a bonding molecular orbital specifically named sigma 2p now if there was destructive combination then we have an antibonding molecular orbital named sigma star 2p. Now here's what happens when the p orbitals are parallel to each other. We're going to be forming pi molecular orbitals. This is very similar to the pi bonding in valence um, orbital theory. But here we're, we're forming orbitals instead. So if these two p orbitals are constructively combined, we would have a pi 2p orbital. If they combine destructively, then we have a pi star 2p antibonding molecular orbital. Again here, there's a node in between the electron density here with the antibonding is outside of the nuclei. Now don't forget, in the P subshell, there are three orbitals. So we have to have a third orientation for our P orbitals. So this, these two are along the Y axis, but we still see the same type of bonding and anti-bonding orbitals uh, like we did in the last slide. Okay, so we have another pi 2p bonding molecular orbital and another pi star 2p molecular antibonding orbital. Okay, so now here is the diagram with 2s and 2p atomic orbitals and all the molecular orbitals that would be produced. Okay, and specifically, this is for molecules O2, F2, and Ne2. We'll take a look at the others a little bit later, but let's 
just break this down bit by bit. The 2s and the sigma 2s orbitals, you, you've seen that already, so I, I feel like this part of the diagram is easy enough to understand. Let's look at the ones with uh, the 2p atomic orbitals. We're combining six atomic orbitals, and we are forming six molecular orbitals. Three of them are going to be bonding. The other three are going to be anti-bonding. Now take a look. One of them, one of the bonding orbitals, is going to be sigma 2p. So that means there's got to be a sigma star 2p somewhere. So here it is at the top. And then, higher up on the energy, we have pi 2p. And you can see that we have two degenerate molecular orbitals here. And that's because there were two different ways in forming the pi 2p molecular orbital. So if we have these two bonding orbitals, we should also have two anti-bonding orbitals. So here we are. We have pi star 2p anti-bonding molecular orbitals. And these are also degenerates. OK? Um, you should also see that the sigma 2p is lower in energy compared to the pi 2p orbitals. Now, that should make sense to you because, remember, um, in the valence bond theory, the sigma bond is stronger than the pi bond. So if the sigma bond is stronger, that means that it's more stable, and so it has less potential energy. So this is written or drawn lower compared to the pi 2p molecular orbitals. Okay, so this is the arrangement for, again, O2, F2, and Ne2. Well, what about the others in that second row of the periodic table? Here we go. We have B2, C2, N2. Now, why are these divided up? Here, here's our O2, F2, and Ne2. Okay. So why are these six divided up? It's because we have a different order here for the sigma 2p and the pi 2p orbitals. So why, why are these three orbitals flipped? What's going on? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about sp mixing. So let's take a quick refresher on atomic radius and z effective. So as we move from left to right across the periodic table, the atomic radius is going to decrease. Also, the Z effective is going to increase in the same direction. You can also see in this picture that the P and S orbitals are being pulled closer and closer to the nucleus as we move from left to right. So now let's take a look at the left side of the pink line. You can see that those elements, like Li, Be, there are small energy differences between the P and S orbitals. So because of that, these orbitals are more likely to mix there's going to be more sp mixing. If we take a look at the elements on the right-hand side of the pink line, we can see that these energy differences are quite large. So because of that, there's going to be less sp mixing. So as we go from left to right across the period, we're going to see less sp mixing because the energy differences between the s and p orbitals are going to increase going from left to right. 
now we'll take these elements and turn them into diatomic molecules. And here we have the molecular orbital diagrams for each of these molecules. Specifically, we're going to take a look at the sigma 2p and the pi 2p orbitals, since they're the ones that switch places. You can see that the energy for these orbitals gets smaller from left to right. We could see the same thing for the sigma 2p orbitals, but it's a more drastic change. And so much so that we could see where the order changes. So if we just focus on the six diatomic molecules, you'll see where the order changes when we're concerned with the sigma 2p and the pi 2p orbitals. Here we have the valence electrons filled in for all six of these diatomic molecules. And here you could also compare the bond orders, bond energies, and bond lengths regarding these six molecules. Note that N2 has a bond order of three, and when you draw out the Lewis structure for N2, it does have a triple bond. Same thing with O2, has a bond order of two, and we know that it does have a double bond. And E2 doesn't exist, and that's why it has a bond order of zero. We know that O2 is paramagnetic because of its attraction to a magnetic field, but we couldn't show that with Lewis theory or valence bond theory. Based on the molecular orbital diagram from the last slide, we saw that O2 actually does have unpaired electrons, which shows its paramagnetism. Here we're looking at the N2 minus ion. You need to draw out the molecular orbital diagram to figure out which bond is stronger, the one in N2 minus or N2. And then you need to figure out if N2 minus is diamagnetic or paramagnetic. So please pause the video, draw out the diagram with all the valence electrons, and when you're ready for the answers, click play. Okay, so here's our diagram. We're working with 11 valence electrons. You could see that in this diagram, we have eight bonding electrons. So here we have two, four, six, eight, and three electrons in the antibonding orbitals. So we have two, three. We put these numbers into our equation and our bond order for N2 minus is plus 2.5. Now remember, N2 has a bond order of three. So the bond in the N2 minus ion is weaker. Also, we could see that there is an unpaired electron in this diagram, so N2 minus is paramagnetic. So make sure you follow these steps, even if the question is just simply asking um, if a molecule or an ion is diamagnetic or paramagnetic, you need to draw out this molecular orbital diagram. So here you're going to do the same thing for N2+. Draw the MO diagram to figure out which bond is stronger, the one in N2+, or N2, and then say whether or not N2+, is diamagnetic. So please pause the video, draw all of that out, and when you're ready for the answers, click play.
Okay, so here is the diagram for N2+. We're working with nine valence electrons now because of this plus sign. One valence electron was taken away from just regular N2. Here's our equation for bond order. So we have seven electrons in the bonding orbitals. So two, four, six, seven, and then two electrons found in the antibonding orbital. So it's just these two. We do our math and that is 2.5 for the bond order. And again, N2 has a bond order of three, so that one is the stronger one, the one found in N2. And looking at our diagram again, we see that we have one unpaired electron, so N2 plus is paramagnetic. Now figure out uh, the bond order for Ne2. So please pause the video, draw out the diagram, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. Okay, so here is the diagram for Ne2. We are working with 16 valence electrons. Eight of them are found in the bonding orbitals. The other eight are in anti-bonding. So when you do the math, the bond order is zero. We don't have to figure out if this is paramagnetic or diamagnetic because this molecule just does not exist. All the diatomic molecules we're looking at so far were homonuclear. So the atomic orbitals from two oxygen atoms are of the same energy level. So those two atomic orbitals will contribute equally to the molecular orbitals. Now when we have molecules that have two different atoms, then those atomic orbitals are going to contribute differently to the molecular orbitals. You'd have to figure out which one of the two atoms that make up the molecule is more electronegative because that's the one that's going to be lower in energy. Those atomic orbitals will be lower in energy. And so they are going to contribute more to the bonding molecular orbitals. The other atom, the less electronegative one, the atomic orbitals from that atom is going to contribute more to the antibonding molecular orbitals. So here our first heteronuclear diatomic molecule is NO. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So you could see the atomic orbitals that oxygen contributes are less in energy compared to those from the nitrogen. So if you were going to take a ruler and measure the distance between atomic orbitals um, and molecular orbitals, you'll see if we measure this distance here from 2s of the oxygen to sigma 2s, it's a shorter distance compared to the 2s from nitrogen going to sigma 2s. Now let's do the same thing um, where our destination is the sigma star 2s. If we measure, measure the distance between the oxygen and sigma star, that's a longer distance compared to starting with the 2s from nitrogen going to sigma star 2s. And you'll see the same thing with the two p's and the sigma 2p and the pi 2p bonding and anti-bonding orbitals.
when we look at this electron density map of NO, we'll see that most of the density is around this oxygen. And that's because oxygen contributes most to the sigma 2s bonding orbital. Remember that fluorine is the most electronegative element. So its atomic orbitals are going to have very, very low energy levels. So here you could see, we don't even see 2s in the picture because it's so low in energy. The fluorine atom would contribute atomic orbitals found in the 2p subshell. Here we have the CN minus ion. You have to figure out if this ion is paramagnetic or diamagnetic. So you're going to use the same process as before. Pause the video, draw out the diagram, and fill it up with the number of valence electrons. And when you're ready for the answers, click play. Okay, so we count 10 valence electrons. Don't forget about that negative charge. Here is the orbital diagram with the 10 electrons filled in. When you count everything properly and you plug those numbers into the equation, we get a bond order of plus three. So this molecule does exist and figuring out if this is paramagnetic or diamagnetic, we see that all the electrons are paired up. So CN minus is diamagnetic. You're gonna use the same process for NO. And here specifically, they're telling you to use the orbital diagram for O2. So pause the video draw everything out, and when you're ready for the answers, click play. Okay, so here's the molecular orbital diagram for NO. There are 11 valence electrons. Eight of them are found in the bonding orbitals, and three are in the anti-bonding orbitals. Okay, so our bond order here for NO is 2.5. We see that there's one unpaired electron, so the molecule NO is paramagnetic. Now let's take a look at resonance and the molecular orbital theory. In this new theory, we could see that the electrons can move throughout the entire molecule. With the older two bonding theories, the electron pairs would just be stuck on one atom, and we know that that doesn't make sense. Using the Lewis bonding theory, we can draw out resonance structures showing that the electrons do move around but if we take a look at one of these structures, we see that the electron pairs are just localized. They're stuck on one atom. Even if you take a look at all the resonance structures together, you see that the electrons aren't really moving, like they're not spread out. With the valence bond model, yeah, we could see that a double bond is really a sigma bond plus a pi bond, but still, these electrons are stuck on one atom. Here is how we can depict ozone using the molecular orbital theory. If all the orbitals are in phase, if we have constructive combination, then we can see that the electrons can move throughout this molecule. Here is benzene. 
drawn as Lewis structures, resonance structures. You can see the double bond alternating between these two structures. But still, these bonds are just located between two atoms. When you're working with the molecular orbital theory, again, when everything is being combined constructively, you can see that now electrons can move throughout this benzene ring. At this point, you're introduced to three different bonding theories, Lewis, valence, and molecular orbital. Which one of these statements accurately describes a chemical bond based on the molecular orbital theory? So pause the video, read these statements very carefully, and when you're ready for the answer, click play. The answer is letter C. So the one thing that all three theories have in common is that when bonds form, the energy gets lowered. So the key phrase that you need to look out for is molecular orbitals. You'll only find this phrase in the molecular orbital bonding theory. Let's take a look at the other two choices. So here they talk about the bond being an overlap between half-filled atomic orbitals. That is valence bond theory. Okay, so make sure that you have that phrase down. Letter B talks about the chemical bond being a shared electron pair. Okay, so those are our um, electron groups, one of the electron groups. So that is Lewis bonding theory. So um, if I were you, I would just take out a piece of paper, draw out um, a table showing the differences and the similarities of these three bonding theories.